time to tantalize your earbuds with creative makers and shakers. It's Creative Living, the podcast with Jane Klaus. This is Creative Living, the podcast. Hi there, I'm Jane Klaus. Thanks so much for joining us today. So I have been a creative maker since I can remember. Always recycling, upcycling, glue sticks, scissors, construction paper, all of those things part of my world probably since the age of five years old. And then at age seven, I started sewing and I've been making ever since. Now, I was never a professional artist where I sell my art or the things I make because, well, my parents just said, don't be an artist. You'll never make any money. (laughs) But (laughs) Thanks, mom. But I've always been interested in the makers movement. And probably, I would say since... Uh, 2010, I've been pushing the idea of the return of the maker. So I've been featuring creative makers on television segments, radio interviews, TV shows. I really want to encourage people to get creative and make. And I'm also a spokesperson for several craft brands. So we fast forward 12 years later, And this book comes along called The Return of the Artisan, talking about how artisans and the craft culture are taking over, how they are becoming mainstream. So I am excited to welcome to the show the author of that book. He is a cultural anthropologist with a PhD from the University of Chicago, Grant McCracken. Hey, Grant. Hey, Jane, how are you? Thank you so much for having me on the show. I am excited that you are on the show and your resume is pretty extensive. Uh, One of the things here, you taught at Harvard. You were the founder of the Institute of Contemporary Culture at the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, So you taught at University of Cambridge, MIT. I mean, can we just dumb it down for me, please? What? No, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're the last person I need to dumb it down for. I'm teasing you. Um, no, I mean you're you're such a you're such an expert in the field, and I want to talk a little bit about the field. First, explain to us what is a cultural anthropologist. Um, a cultural anthropologist is somebody who studies uh, human communities and especially the 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 meanings and the rituals and the the patterns of life that make their lives make sense. So I'm interested in in any time anybody uh, communicates with somebody else in their culture. I'm really interested in any time somebody makes something in their culture for themselves or other people. And that's kind of where we get into the artisanal. Jumping into the first question here is, uh, what was it about the idea of this? I call it the maker's movement or the artisanal creators. What, What was it about that that interests you of this topic? I guess part of it is just that it is so powerful, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, for for the most of the time the species has spent on the planet, we have been artisans. And eventually, and just, and and for about 200 years, we became industrial. Um, And then suddenly we, and we kind of sneered at things that were artisanal and handmade, right? It was better to have things from a factory. And we, you know, people would send stuff home when it wasn't, um, sealed in a box from the factory because it wasn't perfect. It wasn't mm-hmm. pristine. And now we look at that stuff and go, oh, please, not another piece of junk from a factory. We And we're thrilled to have something that's homemade and handmade and human scale and you know has all of the properties that make it intimate and uh, um, a welcome part of our lives. So that shift is big. Moving from that industrial era to the in- the artisanal era is a big change for us. And so I'm interested in any big changes that happen to our culture. But I was really interested in this for, uh, well, now I'm blabbing. So I'm going to let up um, before I just keep talking. Or do, I, I love that you keep talking. Okay. When okay. did this shift begin from industrial to artisan? Because I, I still feel like people sort of look down their nose at the handmade because yeah. they would rather buy it from a store. Yeah. Or if they say, if I say, oh, I made this, you know, somebody yeah. who's not really into that handmade object may say, oh, well, that's not good enough because it doesn't have a label on it. But when yeah. did that industrial, when did it shift from industrial to artisan? Yeah, I think it some, happened sometimes af- after World War II. During World War II, we got very good at making stuff with machines. 
We got very good at making food with machines, right? So food now came off uh, assembly lines, and we thought that was a good thing. And then at some point in the 70s, thanks to the hippie revolution and then to people like Alice Waters, who was living in Northern California, creates this restaurant called Chez Panisse and says, let's, let's think about food again. Do we really want it coming from a factory? Don't we want it from local farmers? Um, don't we want it made in tiny portions by by highly skilled people as opposed to kind of the fast food model of, of the production of food. So I think that's the that's when it really starts to shift. So if you needed a year, you could say 1971, the year that uh, Alice Waters created Chez Panisse. That's a great year. That's the year I was born. So ah. I feel like I had part of, I had a play, a play in it a little bit. <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, when we talk about artisans, and I even bring up Alice Waters, who is a chef, you know, right. You, you, and you talk a lot in the culinary world when we talk about artisans, but artisans is a really large group. So explain who artisans are in your point of view. Right. I think it's anybody who is working, um, uh, uh, making stuff by hand, um, working in small lots. Um, almost always artisans are making stuff for people they know or will eventually meet at the far farmer's market or at, at some, you know, some fair. Um, so something very personal ab about the moment of commerce where it changes hands. So it's, it's very personal, it's very customized there in the making and in the selling and in the using, right? The object enters somebody's life and it becomes part of their, it doesn't, you know, something that comes from a factory sits there like a stranger in your household. Something's artisanal enters the meaning uh, and, and the hominess of your home and, and takes up a place there. So in, in every spot that the object plays a part in our lives, it's changed by this artisanal approach. In 1971 was a new concept. And over time, you know, there's been craft fairs and art fairs. And, you know, we always talk like, oh, it's not your grandma's Kleenex box. You know, it's, right. it's, it's something more special. Like this is something that you would really want to use as, as home decor. But that the birth of that maker's movement seemed a little bit difficult. Was it difficult or was it because it wasn't in the forefront, like mainstream? And why was that? Yeah, I think maybe one of the things that uh, uh, drove it was the way in which we changed the way we thought about things like gifting. In the old days, gifting could be off a shelf, out of a box, from a factory. And increasingly, we said, you know, to be a good gift, something has to be really intimate and personal and uh, has to feel like I made a particular, I, the gift giver made a particular choice and I went looking for somebody who, who created this thing as a personal expression of themselves. Um, and once that way of thinking about gifting happened, I think we started to, to really look. Now, maker's fairs were great, no longer curiosity. Now that was the place you were going for your Christmas shopping. And it still is. Maker's fairs are someplace you go for your Christmas shopping. And and Grant, what I do in my life is because people still kind of like, oh, you you this was made or it's handmade. I get something store bought and I pair it with something handmade. So mm -hmm. then you're getting that touch of heartfelt, you know, that yeah. really personal gift. And then, yeah. of course, you're fulfilling the need for something that was bought from the store. And yeah. that's a mindset that I have. And hopefully that's shifting as yeah. people, as this becomes a little bit more and more popular and into the forefront. Do you see that? Yes. And and didn't you invented the term upcrafting? I love the term upcrafting because you could take anything and you upcraft it. So crafting, again, back to, it, it's almost like a dirty word. People want to throw up a little bit in their mouth when I say I'm a crafter. So I thought, well, upcrafting is sort of the disruptor's way of saying, I'm going to take this that you bought at the store or something vintage or something old, and I'm going to upcraft it and yeah. give it a new life. Yeah. And now I'm eco-friendly. Yeah, absolutely. No, I love that. And certainly, the you know, talking about the trends that have pushed the artisanal movement, um, the whole eco ecological piece has, has made a, an enormous contribution here. So, yes, in fact, a lot of the stuff that uh, enters the um, artisan's economy would otherwise get thrown into landfill. So, um, hallelujah, that's a big benefit. And we talk a lot about what's going on in the landfills, especially in the fashion world. And and I love to upcycle thrift store clothing and, and T-shirts and jeans because those in the landfill, they're not going to break down really yeah. quick and easy. So yeah. if we can do something else with them. The book is called Return of the Artisan, How America Went from Industrial 
to handmade. Who did you write the book for? Was it us makers and crafters or was it just as a, an announcement to say, hey, guys, here's a shift that you need to look at? Uh, I think it was a bit of both. Um, I was also thinking about people who have been pushed out of the industrial economy and were now facing the prospect of unemployment. I thought, well, the artisanal economy is a great place for them to get involved with in a new economy, the artisanal economy. And um, that will give them a new set of skills, a new set of contacts, a new set of of relationships in the community. Um, it will draw them into farmers markets. It will be good for the people who come out of the industrial, get pushed out of the industrial economy and then think, oh my God, what do I have to live for? And those are the people sometimes who fall into the clutches of you know bad things like opioid addiction and stuff like that. Um, that's the last thing we want to have happen. So I thought that community too. The, the other group I thought, you know, during COVID, we had people with um, with deep pockets leaving New York City and Chicago and Los Angeles and going to small towns to take refuge there, and they were taking with them their 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 big city incomes, and they were now buying things and supporting local artisans in a way that those artisans uh, hadn't always been supported for. So we're looking at that, and that's the last chapter of the book is to think about the possibility that. Those small towns that are now seeing rivers of capital pour into them and seeing those all of that capital funding artisanal activities in new ways, restaurants and, and fairs and, and, and theaters and whatever happens, and that, that we could see a kind of revival of small town America, which is, as you I'm sure know, is a community that sometimes struggle, struggles to make its way in the world. So the artisanal economy is making contributions in all directions. You know, there's a a thing that the artists do. And if you have a full-time nine to five job, if you will, we call it a side hustle and right. I've got a sewing machine and I can embroider and I'm going to make yeah. patches and I'm going to sell them online. Yeah. And now I have a side hustle that I'm making some money on, but can these artisans make a living if the side hustle becomes their full-time job, especially in the world of inflation and financial insecurity. So how do we leave that and, and say, I think that I can still fund my 401k, not sure we want to today, but is, is that possible? I think we're getting there. We're not there yet, which is, 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 um, is tragic. Um, but, you know, we've seen the creation of a creator economy. There's now capital, um, venture capital is pouring into the world of the creator economy. So we're seeing the funding is there, uh, the people are there, the markets aren't quite as robust as they as they might be. Consumers have some ways to go. Consumers are completely signed up for artisanal food, of the artisanal piece of, of food, right? And that's meant that they're no longer, you know, that old notion about uh, do you shop at the center of the supermarket or on the outside? And people are just no longer much interested in, in shopping at, in the center. They don't want food that's packaged and prepared and adulterated and preserved. So they're really signed up for the artisanal piece of this. They have yet to sign up as completely for other pieces, but I think that's coming slowly. I think it's coming slowly too, especially with a lot of online sort of teaching sites like Craftsy, um, Blueprint, they're teaching you how to be a maker and maybe start your own small business, but they've definitely caught on to the craft beer, the, um, you know, the homemade jams and jellies and breads. And, and that's, you know, stuff in the, in the food world of the artisan. We talk about small business. It sort of is where people are falling into now because of what happened during the pandemic. They're starting these small business. Can that be an engine to help fuel this economy? Yeah. I think so. And, you know, um, Amex, American Express, has created some small business festivals. They don't quite see the artisanal angle, which is a pity, because they could make a huge contribution there. The other thing that's, I think, happening is that we're watching uh, the Magnolia Network and H HGTV starting to have shows about artisanal makers, and that's a huge contribution. I think Magnolia by itself has turned Waco, Texas from whatever it was before into a place that's just buzzing with artisanal activity. So that's a great, that's a great contribution. I love when media acknowledges what's happening in the pop culture world. Now pop culture, meaning the artisan shows, the DIY shows I've been pushing for so long for eyeballs 
to get on those and meaning executive eyeballs. So the Magnolia Network has done wonderful things for the worlds of crafters and makers and artisans. And I would like to see more and more producers, television producers, actually open their eyes to this movement that's happening. And I'm hoping your book does that. Oh, well, from, from your lips to God's ears. <laughs> I'm going to send them a copy of your book because I've been trying to tell them this for the last 12 years. I'm like, no, no, it's coming. People want making. They want the handmade. They want it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very much. Totally. And you're proving it right now. I'm going to read a quote here from, it was in your book, the Institute for the Future what's happening with this makers moving the the next decade we'll see continued economic transformation and the emergence of a new artisan economy what is happening with the economic shift is that the future yeah well that's you know it it, it approaches and then the tide goes back a little bit and it's kind of two steps forward one step back but i think we're getting there i think we're definitely getting there and as you say when Magnolia gets involved, um, when when shows, when you now have not just one or two shows, but entire networks to, uh, dedicated to the artisanal proposition, you know something is on the map, that it's now a part of our culture that can't be ignored and that won't go away. Yeah, and I think you get more people talking about it, like you, like me, like the people I interview on the show, the folks that are working with the Magnolia Network, and then we just continue to fuel the excitement for the makers movement. Mm -hmm. There are friends of mine who say, oh, I, I, I can't make that. I don't even want to try to make it. I'm not creative. I can't do it. I'd rather just buy it. Fine. Great. Because then you're going to pay for the people that are making it. So industry will still happen because right. it's 2022 and this is what's happening in our world. Can industrial capitalism live happily and hand in hand with the artisan community? Yeah, I think so. I think eventually it becomes something like um, the backdrop. It becomes the, you know, the ghost kitchen of capitalism. It's what happens behind the scenes where some things that have to can only be made in an industrial way do get made in an industrial made. But every time we go to the marketplace to engage with something, to buy something for our, our domestic lives, for, our, for our, ourselves and our families, that will feel increasingly artisanal. And yes, there'll be great gigantic machines running in the background, but 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 the the place that we interact with capitalism will feel more and more artisanal. Yeah, and actually we need industry because they're making, you know, they have the technology to make the machines that we use to do our handmade, and then we can make more handmade, and then we can sell that right back to the big companies. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> We're making money from that. The pandemic. Before the pandemic, we were busy, we're working, we've got soccer practice, we got to make dinner, we're going to work. We're all stuck at home during the pandemic. We found the kitchen. We started yeah. baking, hello, bread. And yeah. we started making, oh, uh, here's some glue. And we started sewing and we started all of these things. Will the movement, that, that culture, that maker's culture that everybody found over the last three years, will that continue to grow? Or do you think it'll subside because everyone has to go back to work? Yeah, that's a lively question, and, and everyone in the corporate world is asking it. And I did my anthropology, my ethnography in COVID homes during COVID, and women were very clear about how they felt about this. They said, listen, I now have, I've, I've got back two hours a day that I don't have to spend commuting, and I spent that on my, my family and uh, I spent my spent that on myself and I've learned new skills. And yes, I'm cooking and my little boy now has a cooking show on the Internet. I'm not giving that up. A friend of mine actually does have a little an eight year old who now has a cooking show on the Internet. So, yes, people got incredibly involved and they say, you know, when the corporation says that it wants me to come back to work, I say to myself, get your hand out of my pocket. Right. That's time. Two hours a day. I spent that on my family. I, I'm not taking it away from my family. I'm not giving it to you. And now I look at all of the buffing and polishing that was necessary to be presentable for the world of work. And I think, what was that about? I think that was theater. And who, for whom was it theater? For men in the C-suite mm -hmm. who needed to see women coming into work uh, every day. So, you know, there's some feeling, some feminist feeling here that this was all a kind of a way of appealing to male egos and that 
as one of the women I interviewed said, you know, women can do a lot of things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so let them stay at home where they can, they will do a lot of things at the same time. You force them to go to work and you take them out of that workflow and that opportunity to work with their kids, to work with, well, in that some of the husbands have gone back to work, but that notion that the home is now itself, this kind of little artisanal um, economy, I, I think a, a lot of women are very reluctant to give that up. Yeah, it, we're really good at multitasking. Not only can we multitask, we'll probably get triple the work done that we would have done in the office anyway. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Because we're not spending the time commuting. We're able to balance the day and get things done. But I, I find that with a lot of people that have stayed home, you know, they're getting a little bit more interested in an extracurricular activity, whether that be cooking or, or crafting or sports or exercise, or what have you. But they're also getting way more work done. Although I did read in the paper today, said, hey, Gen Xers, millennials, don't get used to this remote work situation. You're going to have to come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw a piece online. I will send this to you. Um, um, but in fact, somebody who's in a position to know says this will be a war. Um, it looked for a moment like nobody was going back. And then, of course, everyone started, the people in the C-suite started to say, you have to come back. Um, and, and it looked like people were going to come back. And now we're getting another wave of resistance. So um, just as we have another break in, another increase in COVID, and just as we have, that will hit this summer, the end of the summer, which okay. means by fall, when everybody, when everyone hopes to get people back to work, people are going to go, no, it's, they will have grounds to say, this is dangerous. I don't want to do it. But in fact, the, the real agenda here is I don't need to do it. And you don't need me to do it. Just let me work from home. And it actually works. Exactly. You can still see people. Yes. You, and I don't, I'm not mad about the one day, the two day you're in, you, you know, you have a little bit of social interaction with the folks you work with, but if you're getting the work done at home, I think it's great the way it's changed the way we work because it's allowing us to do more. Now, in the book, you talk about the 24 characteristics of artisans from imperfection to happiness. What are those? Can you run us through some of those characteristics and how does it influence uh, the success of the makers versus the non makers? Right. I think one of the keys here is that notion of human scale. Right. We used to go to a big factory and work on things and you have no idea who designed it or you can see it running past you on the assembly line. It goes out the door. You have no idea who ends up buying it. And everything about the artisanal world is scaled down and is little and it's intimate. And, and you know people, you know your neighbors who've made a contribution to your own artisanal economy. And you, and you go to the farmer's market or the craft fair and you see the people who buy what you're making. I think that that intimacy of scale, which, as I say, what used to be the thing that defined industry and, and economy uh, before the advent of an artisanal era, that's that's back. And I think we'll be reluctant to give it up. Um, what else? Yes, there's happiness here to the extent that in the book I talk about the woman who knows that she's got a job review. Uh, coming up at, at her big corporation and is worried about how she's going to be judged. I say this, that, that woman no longer does that. She takes her best friend to the coffee shop and says, so how do you think I'm doing? Be honest, right? It's an, an entirely different, it's not some big machine judging you and collecting data and making determinations. It's people being as honest as they can with one another about a, the very personal thing called their artisanal economy. And my girlfriends and I call that the board meeting <laughs> the board Perfect. because I'm not going to the corner office or the morning sales meeting and everyone gets a job. I go in with a group of friends who are all entrepreneurs in their own right, no one does the same thing. And we go, okay, here's what's going on. Here's what I need to improve on. Here's what I'm focused on. And here's what I'd like to do. Or do you have any suggestions? And it's opinions from people who are in the same boat without the same situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, I think we're pooling our knowledge. And that's another piece of those 24 um, things that define the artisan is that uh, we're working with one another and sharing knowledge and building up our stocks of competence and, and interest and engagement and all of that, it, it, it exists as a kind of almost underground lake of, of capability. It doesn't take very long to figure out that there's somebody in your community, your extended network, who knows how to solve the problem you're working on and to reach out to them and, and to get them to help you to do that. 
that's a, a splendid way, I think, of, of going to work. Yeah. And I guess you could take some of the tactics that you had used from a corporate job that you had, and then you bring them into your own small business or your side hustle. But you take yeah. some of those principles and you implement it yeah. into this small business or, or this artisan revolution. Do the characteristics define, the, the 24 characteristics that you write in the book, do they define what a artisanal preneur is? Yes, absolutely. And you're right. In that case, some people will have created a startup in the, the conventional world. And, and, you know, one of the pieces we're seeing this play out now is with boomers and with the boomers who are saying, you know, when I get to 60 or to 70, um, this is a point in my life where I'm going to reinvent myself. And I've talked to people who say, listen, I'm sort of like a teenager at this point, I'm not quite sure who I, I'm going to be. I have to figure that out. And the artisanal angle is a perfect one for them. They can start a small business. And as you say, they often have fabulous uh, experience in the startup entrepreneurial uh, world and they have all of that to draw upon as they as they create a small business of an artisanal kind. So with the shift in culture that you wrote the book on and that you've been watching and researching and you're talking about, do you consider that an artisanal disruptor or disruption? Yes. You do. Yeah, I do. Um, a disruption for me is that moment where the rules of the game change so profoundly that somebody who belongs to the old game wakes up and goes, what just happened? suddenly there has been a disruption. It means the fundamental assumptions of the business or the industry that they're a part of has changed. And they're now obliged to see where the, the change has taken place and to adapt. And because these are deep seated assumptions, that adaptation is often really difficult for people. It's like they really have to rethink who they are and what they're doing in the world of work in a fundamental way. And it's never easy. Um, so uh, I think, yes, the artisanal thing is so different from the industrial thing, right? Because it, it's all of, it's you doing everything yes. for, for, instead of that division of labor that used to characterize the corporation where you would have to work with teams of people to get right. anything done yeah. and consult with them to figure out. Now it's, uh, I was talking to one guy who was working, he was building uh, platforms for people to put their iPads on. And he said, you know, I, this is driving me crazy. I, I I don't know how to do the marketing. And I thought, dude, you've already done all the hard part. The marketing part is not the hard part. You know somebody who knows about branding and marketing, and they will help you sort this out. And sure enough, he 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 got that solved. So yeah, I think it's uh an interesting and collaborative world, which makes it very different from the old uh, kind of industrial capital. I've always wanted to be a disruptor. I'm 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 a disruptor. Yeah, and, but you have to really figure out you know, disruptor meaning that in a really good sense of the word, you're changing the way people think about something. I'm so happy that you're talking about it. The future of the artisanal revolution, will the DIY culture continue to grow and how big can it get? Hmm. Yeah, I think it will continue to grow and I think it will continue to have this disruptive effect. We have a guy living in my community who runs a cheese store. He's a cheesemonger. And his idea is uh, he's helped people become more sophisticated when it comes to cheese. But when you ask him about what his job is really for, he says it's to change how people entertain in this town on a Saturday night. The old deal used to be you would go to somebody's house and be a beautiful meal and a beautiful table. And everyone's really sort of sh showing off, e even as they're having a, a lovely meal. And he says, that's not what I want. I want that meal to consist of a really good cheese or two, a great bottle of wine, and then people standing around the island in the kitchen and having this really rich and sometimes difficult conversation instead of the set piece stuff that they do at, at a beautiful table. He's, he's a disruptor right down to the ground. He's a revolutionary. He wants to change how people uh, celebrate Saturday night in Connecticut. That makes him a revolutionary of the very first order, because God knows if there's something that has to change, it's it's Saturday night in Connecticut. <laughs> I actually feel like you might have been peering in my windows on Saturday night <laughs> <We're> around <laughs> the island and some really good cheese and a couple of bottles of wine, having a really fun, maybe touchy conversation. I mean, that's that's the way we do it, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, that's really fun. Um, the creators 
and the makers are just screaming with excitement that you actually are acknowledging what we're doing, what they're doing from a perspective of, of here's how it was, here's what's happening, and here's the shift, yeah. which is fantastic. How, how did the big businesses feel about it? Does it matter yeah. to them? I think, you know, I see some people abandoning ship. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the people who used to make CPG uh, goods, uh, consumer packaged goods, are getting out of that industry because they can see the, the shrinkage coming. I think maybe one of the things that can happen on the artisanal side of this development is, is this. I think artisans are accustomed to saying, I have a different model for how I want to live my life and, and, and create, make my contribution to the economy. And I can see that other people care about it, and I can see how it's distributed across the American economy. What we don't yet have, I think, is some sense of, yes, this is the beginning of a complete revolution that will change not just economies, but even how people celebrate on a Saturday night in Connecticut. But this is a big, huge change. And it's as if we have yet to shift from all of these hundreds of thousands of artisans working their separate things, making iPad stands and make you know cheese and, and just scaling up to this is a real change. You know, and that often happens kind of slowly in the American case. You've got a group of people who have created a social or cultural innovation, and it happens in pockets and it's distributed, but it's not yet, to use your term, disruptive, right? Because it's not as if everyone has gone, okay, this is a thing. It's not just a thing for me and my friends. It's an American thing. This is how Americans do the critical part of their economy. So thank you for your work in this area, which has contributed so mightily to that kind of growing national consciousness that this is a bigger revolutionary activity. I love it. I'm telling you, you know, we get emails talking about what's, you know, health and wellness and creativity. And I saw that the title of your book, I'm like, who, 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 what? Let's do this. Let's talk about this. I want everyone to hear more about what Grant McCracken has to say about the return of the artisan. And I'm fine working hand in hand with big company, big industry, and also continuing to shine the spotlight on all of these makers. I went to a craft convention that I love to go to and I watched the speaker and he said, every business is touched by handmade, whether you like it or know it or not. Mm. And that was maybe five or six years ago. And so yeah. I feel like this person that was talking about it was sort of picking up or, or starting to to really say, hey, you guys are doing the right thing. Keep going. And here you are writing a, a huge book about it, shining a spotlight on it for all of us. Before I let you go, Grant, what does living creatively mean to you? Oh, wow. For me, creativity is what happens when I get words on the page. So I get up very early every morning and see if I can coax some words to, to um, flow out onto a page and then to reconfigure themselves until I think, oh, that could be a new idea. So that, <laughs> that's my artisanal activity. It's word herding. Word herding. Easier than cats, right? <laughs> Only just. <laughs> <laughs> Only just easier than cats. I mean, I always say creative living is it's writing, it's cooking, it's making. I mean, there's so many ways to live creatively. You, you can live creatively cleaning. There's so many different hacks mm. and tips and tricks. Whatever it is that makes you feel creative to me is creative living. The book is called Return of the Artisan, How America Went from Industrial to Handmade by Grant McCracken. How can people get their hands on this book? Where can we find more about you? book will be in bookstores um, or they can go to Amazon and, and they'll find it there, a return of the, of the artisan. And more about me, they can go to culturebuy.com, culturebuy.com. Culturebuy.com. That's fantastic. Everybody needs to order their own copy of Return of the Artisan. It is a fantastic book. It gives you lots of insights from the past, present, and the future. And Grant McCracken, thank you so much for joining us on Creative Living. Thank you, Jane. What a pleasure to have a chance to chat. Live better creatively. For more inspiration, visit janeclaus.com. Thank you for listening.